a loving good morning to the people of Christ Church in Eureka, California, from the oratory of the Convent of the Transfiguration in Glendale, Ohio. It's been a long time since I was able to be with you, and I wish it were in person, because I miss you all so very much. Christ Church is where I started to learn to trust again. Christ Church is where I was loved and supported through the ordination process, where I learned to be a priest. You were there when Bishop Barry Beisner ordained me as deacon, and to my great joy and thanksgiving, many of you flew out to be with me when he ordained me as priest here in our chapel. So I have a long history of love and gratitude. I was over the moon when we wondered, did Christ Church have a use for Transfiguration House? And so much creative imagination went into that yes. And now there's that continuing connection between the community of the Transfiguration and Christ Church. So I am very, very grateful to be here today. But we're not here to talk about my emotional reaction to Father Daniel's invitation for me to be with you but about the incredible mystery of the transfiguration. And I have to admit, I wondered, what does the transfiguration have to say to us today during these crazy times that we're living in? But let's dive in together and see what we might discover. So we're going to start out by diving into three different situations, three encounters with eternal love in difficult circumstances three different responses, and one more try to understand even an iota of the mystery and invitation of the transfiguration. How are we going to respond in our own disturbing time? So let's start with Moses. We know the Exodus story, the struggles of frightened, newly freed people making a long trek through the arid and dangerous wilderness, they camped at Mount Sinai, where Moses made the strenuous climb to the top. When he returned, he was carrying two stone tablets written on by God. Now things started to get really interesting. Moses' face was aglow, blazing brightly. Maybe the brightness came from being where the glory of God was manifest. But was it also from sheer joy about God's invitation to the people to enter into intimate covenant relationship? When the people saw Moses' shining face, they went into a blind panic and pleaded not to have to see that light. Were they afraid that they couldn't get things right? Couldn't live up to such glory? Would fail? Even the leaders of the people had this great fear. Would the offered intimacy from God make them too vulnerable? Whatever it was, they encountered what our colleague calls with impressive understatement, the disquietude of this world. How would we react in their shoes or sandals as the case may be? When Jesus asked Peter, James, and John to go with him to the top of another mountain, he was also inviting them into a richer, deeper level of intimacy than they had yet known. As he prayed, they were overwhelmed with light, unlike any they had ever experienced. You know the story. They thought that they had Jesus all figured out. But here they encountered him and Moses and Elijah in a reality beyond comprehension. And they were afraid, major disquietude. What did that all revealing light show them? Had we been there, would we be shaking in our sandals? Most likely. But then, what would we choose to do? The fears resulting from these encounters with overwhelming holiness are different from familiar fear. Most of us have had frightening times. Maybe we've been in a traffic accident, or dangerous weather sent our adrenaline soaring, or one of those sharp earthquakes that goes on and on and on until we wonder, is this the big one? 
or someone we love has tested positive. All causes of disquietude. Yet the fear we hear about in response to Moses' glowing face and Jesus' transfiguration is of an exponentially different magnitude. So let's just take it down a notch and we'll stop by the Sea of Galilee before we return to the two holy mountains. Remember the time when Peter and his companions had been fishing all night and caught nothing? After borrowing their boat as a preaching platform, Jesus told them to go back out and try again. They were skeptical, but they obeyed, and they hauled in a catch of fish so large that it threatened to overwhelm two boats. Peter's response was to fall at Jesus' feet, gasping, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Why? Is it possible that in that moment, Peter felt the agony, the disquietude of shame, of fear of failure, which can sneak up on us? There are no words to describe that shattering darkness, though I think many of us have experienced it. Still, there was something about Jesus in the midst of that costly self-knowledge that kept Peter from turning and leaving. Why did he make the choice to stay? Is it that he sensed somehow that Jesus saw the full truth about him and still loved him? Three encounters with holiness, three choices of response. What would we do? In the wilderness at Sinai, our terrified ancestors in faith chose to beg not to see in the tender compassion of our God, they were given what they asked for. They were given time to grow into the ability to accept the kind of love that breaks down our walls, that shatters fearful stone hearts and replaces them with vulnerable hearts of flesh. They were given time to encounter that stormy inner struggle we all have to deal with and from which our loving God longs to deliver us. When Peter fell on his knees in acknowledgement before Jesus, he too had been granted a glimpse into himself, but he made a different choice. His choice in that moment was to stay with Jesus in the midst of that fearful, hopeless feeling of inadequacy and shame. In spite of his plea to Jesus to leave him, Peter chose not to turn away. He did not beg to avoid seeing the truth. Can you imagine the gentle, tender, joyous smile that lit up Jesus' face as he grasped Peter's hand, pulled him upright, and invited him to become a follower? Peter chose to stay, to become vulnerable, to risk relationship, though he still had a lot to learn, as do we all. On the Mount of the Transfiguration, the three disciples made a further choice. Again, they were encountered by the revealing light of God's implacable love, a love that knows us intimately and yet so thoroughly that it took Jesus to the cross. Luke tells us that right after Peter blurted out his confused and frightened effort to make sense of what was happening, a cloud overshadowed them. Then Luke adds, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. They did not know where it would take them, but in spite of their soul-shaking fear, they chose to enter the cloud. They could only suspect that they were offering up any illusions of being in control, of getting things right under their own power. And now we are faced with similar choices, albeit probably without glowing faces, raiment white and glistening, or boatloads of fish. We're dealing with a time when, as well as our Hebrew kindred, as with Jesus' first disciples, our assumptions about the way things ought to be 
have been yanked out from under us. We are in a wilderness of disease, unrest, chaos, the potential for economic, social, and climatic catastrophe of self-proclaimed Christians preaching hate. We are in a time when fear leads to greater and greater isolation, hatred, division, resentment, and anger. And we are in a time when those fears can harden even our hearts and darken our eyes because soft hearts and eyes open to compassion and truth can feel especially dangerous right now. We are in a time where risking vulnerable, sacrificial relationship is more essential than ever. We're in a time when taking the risk of speaking truth lovingly on behalf of those who cannot speak for themselves is an absolutely essential act of God's love, more so than ever before. We can do this because God, who knows us more fully than we can know ourselves, loves us and yearns for intimacy with us. We already have the light, the divine light, in, among, and around us, even when we can't see it. As we pray in silent attentiveness, opening ourselves to the Spirit, we become freer to make the choice to stay, to serve God and our neighbor, even from within a time when the cloud is so thick we can barely see the next step. Few are given the privilege to see the light with physical eyes. Yet, we pray in the collect for faith to behold the transfigured Jesus. And Jesus is here in Cincinnati, in Eureka, in every place on this planet, with us, leading, loving, guiding. We trust by faith that the light is within us, that we are known that we are loved, and that Jesus is in every other person, even those we find hardest to love. If Jesus is within us, Jesus is within everyone. Thus, we put on our masks, not just because we have to, but because that is a small way to live our love for God and each other when we don't go out, when we keep our distance, when we give up accustomed ways of doing things and find new and different ways to live, when we wash our hands till it feels like the skin is coming off, we continue to love, to live, to find new ways to serve our neighbors without putting them at risk. Thus, we are reflecting the light we so long to see. We'll get it wrong many times, just as all of our ancestors in the faith have done throughout the millennia. We can choose to cringe away, evade the disquietude of seeing what makes us afraid and uncomfortable. We can evade the searching love of our transfigured Lord, or we can choose to stay with it, accepting that we are fully known and fully loved and don't have to worry about being perfect. As one of the great prophets of our time, Leonard Cohen wrote, ring the bells that still can ring, forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. We are, with our ancestors in faith, invited to risk entering ever more deeply and vulnerably into that light, into the transfiguration of Jesus. What will we choose?